But just to start with a couple of years ago, well, every year in February in Sydney, we have the Australian Poultry Science Symposium where all the poultry people of the country meet. And uh, there was early on, before the thing started, there was a sofa sitting there and this guy sitting there, it looked like a fish out of water. So I went over and introduced myself and we started chatting and uh, I expressed a bit of interest in uh, Norm hasn't left me alone since. But uh, anyway, so what he's asked me to do is wow you with UNE's capability to do poultry research. So I've got a whole bunch of slides and I'm going to rip through those really quick. And then at the end, um, I want to spend a little bit more time and show you what the initial waste streams out of those containers look like chemically. And my attempt last night, as a matter of fact, to formulate a chicken diet with it. So, uh, so bear with me if, I'm, uh, if I go through some of the initial stuff er, uh, quickly. So there's this uh, shot of the university. That's an old farmhouse from, um, from the old uh, Armadale. The Armadale was a famous fine sheep, fine wool producing area. And uh, the properties were very big and one of the properties was owned by person that owned that house, I don't really know what their name was, and they bequeathed that to the university. So that's where the vice chancellor and all the, uh, the top brass uh, have their offices. And then we have uh, the photo in the middle, that's the new Center for Animal Research and Teaching, or CART. So in that building we have some instrumentation and whatnot. And then we have another new flash building here, uh, which is the uh, agriculture education building and on the top floor of that we have a gene expression laboratory where we can look at uh, gene expression of various things going on with metabolism, DNA testing and all that sort of stuff. Um, here's a picture taken about a year ago of all the, uh, the staff and uh, graduate students at UNE. I've shown this picture in seminars around the world and uh, people are just really amazed at how many people we do have uh, in poultry at UNE. There I am up in the corner up there. Uh, so we have something called uh, Poultry Research and Teaching Unit. So we do uh, research, health, medicine, physiology, my area is nutrition and metabolism, and then we have somebody else doing some work with uh, chicken welfare and behavior. And then we teach uh, various things, uh, um, poultry production, poultry physiology. Um, we did have a unit on feed science and technology that's gone a bit by the wayside. We have another one on biosecurity. And then we do extension. So from time to time I get phone calls from uh, people from Biota or Ingham's wanting to know what I think about certain things related to feed and, um, and feed production. So and we're pretty close to those people as well. Um, so the current poultry academics at the top there, we've got Steve Walkton Brown, he's the health and welfare person. He, he's not here today, but uh, he's involved in um, doing research with uh, things like Merrick's disease and viruses and whatnot. We've got Ming and Chalk, who everybody knows, he was uh, uh, the poultry nutritionist here, he started the poultry CRC and that's finished and now he's the pro vice chancellor at the university. But he still keeps a, a finger in the area. Uh, myself, Shubia Wu, Tamson Crowley, who's the head of the poultry hub. We've got Isabel, Pita, Priscilla, Natalie, Amy Moss, who's in the back of the room, Nishal Sharma, who's here, and Sarbast. And then uh, picture of a couple of graduate students. When I was a graduate student, I made the students do menial tasks, so I had to make sure I had them doing menial tasks like cleaning, <laughs> cleaning lights. Um, we had some pretty famous uh, academics in the past, Rob Cummings and David Farrell, uh, who I knew both of those guys. About three kilometers further up the road here, we've got uh, there's a few old sheds that Rob Cummings built to do disease research and we took one of those and, and closed it in and made a high-tech uh, um, feeding study area out of that. 
And then we've had other people, Julie Roberts and uh, Paul Eiji and uh, Chuck Gierkin and Medi. Poultry CRC, that has ended. That was uh, um, involved in sustainable, eth ethical poultry production in the face of population growth and climate change. That was their tagline. That went for uh, 14 years. They spent about $75 million of budget that uh, came from the government and from uh, um, industry. And most of that has been, not the money, but the the idea has gone into something called the poultry hub and the idea behind the poultry hub is to share information and that's headquartered here at UNE administered by the university but it has involvement uh, all over Australia so what do we do in uh, poultry research here uh, Steve Walkton Brown does disease research and monitoring he uh, takes dust samples and checks them for uh, Newcastle disease or Merrick's disease or laryngotracheitis, whatever the, whatever is important at the time, and he's, that's part of the monitoring. monitoring. Uh, we have uh, other projects on egg quality and contamination with salmonella, which is very important, and that would be important for this food recycling, especially if you're feeding this stuff to laying hens, you don't want to get salmonella contamination. Uh, we have a big project that has finished on uh, energetics in poultry, something called net energy, which is involved with the heat coming off of the chickens and trying to minimize that and getting all that energy to go more towards the growth. Um, and that all gets involved with formulating the feed as well. We've got another project, a uh, big project on gut health and replacing AGPs, which are antibiotic growth promotants. So most Chickens until recently have been fed low levels of antibiotics to keep the gut healthy and to promote the growth of the chicken. Now your supermarket chains and fast food chains have said that um, uh, they'd rather not do that because there's, uh, there's worry in the medical community that that could possibly cause bacteria to get resistant to antibiotics. And then if, if you get sick and go to the hospital, you're done in because none of the antibiotics will work anymore. And some other things, feed processing, enzymes, odor remediation. Uh, Nishal here did his uh, PhD on odor remediation in poultry. Protein and amino acids. Uh, nutrition of the egg. So we've had, we had a student poking a hole in the egg and putting nutrients in and then sealing it up, incubating it and to see if the baby chicks would be any better off than um, the ones that didn't get it. Uh, and then we've got somebody doing work on free range. So these are just some of the publications. Uh, you can see here quantitative PCR, Merrick's disease. That's Steve Walkton Brown's group. Uh, here's the calorimeter chamber that we did the energy project in. So we're looking to see <clears throat> Uh, what the heat production is and if you measure how much oxygen the birds are using up and how much CO2 they're giving off just like you'd measure a candle burning you can get an idea of the heat being produced so that's what these are to those are potassium hydroxide that's bubbling through that sucks up the CO2 and we analyze that later and then we've got uh, oxygen cylinders there that uh, we can weigh uh, so we've had a few publications on that one. Um, another one here. Uh, and then we've got a big semi-commercial laying shed uh, with caged, a cage layer facility. I think there's 350 cages in there. We've never used all of them at once, but normally we'll use 100 or 150 cages. And then each cage will have a feed bucket. And when the feed in the feeder goes down, you can just feed from the bucket. And then on the, once a week, you dump the feed back in the bucket, weigh the bucket, and you know how much they, they consumed. And then we bring the eggs back and analyze the eggs for uh, something called haw units. That's how high the egg stands up when you crack it. The higher it stands up, the better the egg. If, it's, if you crack an egg and it just goes bleh, then you know that egg's 
really old or something wrong with it. So we do all that. Um, another energy, we did it, that whole project in broilers and in laying hens and just to keep in your mind, you know, I think Norm in his mind is chicken's a chicken, but a chicken is not a chicken. And a chicken is not a turkey and a chicken is not a duck. But as far as chickens are concerned, you have layers and you have broilers. And they're almost as different as a cow and a sheep. Different nutrient requirements, uh, everything's different. Management is completely different. So, but we, our group knows about both. Uh, we've got a new feed mill, so that's the pellet mill there, and that's, I think, uh, about, what's the capacity of that pellet mill? 100 kilos an hour? I'll tell that. Yeah. About 30. 30. 30 kilos an hour, and this is uh, 3 tons an hour. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we, we make enough feed to run big feeding studies with this thing. Um, some other ones, canola seed, oat hulls, insoluble fiber, pellet temperature, nutrient utilization, uh, particle size analysis. So if you want to make a good pellet, it's important to have the right particle size of the raw materials going in. Uh, you don't want too much fat or you won't get a good pellet. And pellets are important. Chickens only have about 15 or 20 taste buds, so they don't really taste much of what they're eating, but what they like is a very uniform texture without a lot of fine particles. So um, pelletability is important for palatability. <laughs> Particle size selection, uh, so we've done work on that with these free range hens. So most laying hens are fed a mash feed, they're not fed a a pelleted feed. So the palatability and pelletability is only for broilers. So for mesh, for layer feeds, they're in mesh form and so the different particles can be important because they might select one over the other. So here's, um, you see those particles there, That's those are uh, crumbled pellets. So when the chickens are very young, you have a pellet and then you run that through a crumbling machine to make it, probably break it into uh, five or six pieces so they can eat it. And uh, that's just a schematic of one of the uh, research in each one of those squares is a, is a pen. And each one of the, um, each pen will fit about uh, 15 chickens and then the, the little green dots are the feeders that you see with the chickens eating there on the left. So we looked at various things. Uh, one of the project we have going with this antibiotic replacement thing is something called necrotic enteritis, because that's usually, if you just completely take out all the antibiotics at once, you'll get a problem with necrotic enteritis. Enteritis is a sick gut, and necrotic means that it's really bad and starting to eat away at the gut lining. So. We've got a model that we actually give the chickens bacteria to make them sick and then we test a lot of things to see which ones worked and uh, hopefully there's something better than an antibiotic. Uh, we've also looked at pelleting condition, canola seeds, oil, uh, odor emissions. This is Nishal's work here and there's Nishal um, with his uh, mass spectrometer there that we hired for two weeks and he worked probably 20 hours a day for two weeks and got all of his data so that was he I think that's probably at two o'clock in the morning there that picture was taken and then uh, we've got the food recycle project that we started and um, so my idea on that was well you're going to need to analyze the stuff to see what the nutrients are and you're also going to need to see how uniform the nutrients are from batch to batch or, or within, you know, within, within a day's containers of material that go through there. Because what a chicken doesn't like is variability and chicken 
people that make chicken feed don't like variability. So that's something that we need to get a, a handle around. And then optimization of the blended products. And then the nutrients we need to examine are minerals, proteins and amino acids, fat, and also digestibility. So here's, and we got these samples last week. These containers have been here, what, about two weeks or two and a half weeks? And uh, it took about a week for them to get them in operation. And then we got, uh, Nathan got waste streams from different people with a, a lot of people really uh, were very helpful, especially Pete here. He knew the guy that ran the local brewery. So he got the brewer's grains and we have a meat lab here. He helped get meat scraps. And so these are the different things that we tested. Fruit and vegetable waste from the supermarket, brewer's grains, and then they had bakery waste, but didn't have much of it. So they blended that with the brewer's grains, 50-50. And then hospital and nursing home. Uh, and I don't know what the story is, but we got some um, bits of almonds from an almond processing factory or alm almond, pro almond packer. So these are all the little broken bits. So we got that. Pub and restaurant and then meat meal, which was made from meat scraps. So the pub and restaurant and the hospital and nursing home, uh, in my mind, are probably fairly similar. And if you look, um, well, let's just look at the moisture content first. So the hospital and nursing home had a lot more moisture than we expected. So I think they didn't really run the, um, the drying machine thoroughly on that one, either that or we made a mistake in the lab, but I think probably it was 18%. But the other ones are very low in moisture, 6%, 2.8, 11.1, uh, 4.3, 7.5, and 7.4, and um, if you probably convert that to a dry weight basis and convert that to a dry weight basis, they're probably very close to one another in crude protein. So how do you measure crude protein, and what does that tell you? Well, crude protein is just the measure of nitrogen. So you take the sample, put it in a furnace, burn it, capture all the nitrogen, measure that, and then you say, oh, okay, well that sample's got X amount of nitrogen. You multiply that by a number, and that gives you crude protein, because most proteins have 16% nitrogen. So 100 divided by 16 is 6.25, so you take the nitrogen times 6.25 and get the crude protein. What does that tell you? The chicken doesn't really care how much protein you put in the feed. What it really cares about is the components of the protein, which are the amino acids. And on top of that, it really cares about the digestibility of those amino acids. But anyway, we can take, and we've sent all those samples in to Macquarie University to get the amino acids analyzed. We'll probably get those results day after tomorrow. The big hole here is fat. We're getting those answers back today uh, in, a, in an hour or so. Um, ash, crude fiber, and gross energy. So who did all these analyses? Well, my analyst did. She's in the back of the room. Stand up, hip. So she's uh, getting her PhD, and she knows how to do all these assays. And while, while hips up, I'd like to give her a special thank you. HIP did, uh, in a PhD, did the uh, studies that we sent and we presented at the uh, Australian Poultry Science Symposium. We, uh, we were one of only a few companies that had a big poster up and uh, HIP presented that at the symposium. She's done fantastic work. She's a, uh, got a, two children at home yet? One. one child at home. She works at the university tirelessly. She did a lot of nighttime work for us here as well. Uh, and she's from Vietnam and where we've got uh, in Vietnam, we're going to be over there with you. <laughs> Thank you, Hit Thank you. So, um, so what I did then is, you know, I didn't really know what the amino acid content of pub and restaurant material was, but I searched on the internet and I found that uh, somebody's actually analyzed food scraps from restaurants in Cuba. 
So there is a, an amino acid profile per the unit protein. So I applied those figures to both the uh, pub and res restaurant and hospital. Brewer's grains, uh, that's uh, amino acid compositions published for those. Fruit and vegetable, uh, there was some material from uh, INRA in France on that. And then meat and bone meal, that's a fairly common uh, material. So I, I just used the amino acid profile for the protein. And then depending on this protein, if it was higher or lower than the sample I had, then all those amino acids got ratioed up or down. So that's pretty well set. Uh, crude fat, I did apply crude fat to all these samples and uh, that was basically based on the information I got off the internet, which was adjusted depending on the gross energy. So if the crude fat for say brewer's grains was 3% and uh, instead of 49.82 it was 4,000 then I said okay well ours is a little bit higher in energy so it's got to have a little more fat in it so I adjusted it that way just to try to do a formulation exercise so there's nothing really good or bad about any of these nutrients here we were a little bit she came to me and she said gee that's got a really high ash content and we looked up normal meat and bone meal and it's exactly about that much ash so the meat and bone meal is just like what you'd probably make in casino or whatever it's uh, high high quality material um, yeah so that's for those and then we did minerals I did a lot more minerals than that but these are the important ones calcium and phosphorus um, and these are spot on to uh, what you'd find in a meat and bone meal um, nothing really too big big or small there what you're really after in a typical chicken feed is roughly about um, two to one for calcium and available phosphorus that's total phosphorus so that would be a little bit higher and by and large they're fairly close to that the only one that is a bit of a concern to me is the sodium because it the requirement for sodium in a broiler feeds about 0.16 or 0.18 percent and they can tolerate a little bit more than that but if it gets too high they're going to drink more water and if they drink more water then their waste that's coming out the back side is going to be a little a little bit sloppy and all broilers are grown on sawdust shavings and all the broiler producers are very, very concerned over wet droppings and wet litter because it's a welfare concern. It causes blisters on the feet and blisters on the breast and whatnot. So we got to keep our eye on that. And probably one of the first things uh, when we test this is maybe just see what their tolerance is to sodium level. The rest of it all looks pretty good. So here's a, and this was last night, I got my formulation program out, I typed in all those values and all the amino acid values and we've got almond meal, brewer's grains, uh, brewer plus bakery 50-50, uh, waste vegetable, waste hospital, food waste meat. And so I told the computer, uh, for the first three don't use more than, uh, the first one I thought was pretty consistent so use you know maximum of 30 percent that's that one and then on the left the amount that it used was so this is a least cost feed formulation program that uses simultaneous equations the inputs are the nutrient content or nutrient profile of each ingredient and the cost and then also the the nutrient content of the finished feed that you enter in there and then you can also enter in minimums and maximums. So here I said, you know, use, I didn't like that food waste vegetable, so I said you got to use 10%. So put a 10% in there and it used it. It was okay. Um, my idea was to have the thing live here and play around with it, but uh, I didn't, didn't, have my, didn't bring my computer today and it might have been a disaster anyway. But 
And then the numbers here, that's the restriction cost. So whenever you put a restriction on, whether it's a minimum or a maximum, if that's holding back and it wants to use more of the product, that, that'll tell you what, how much that's costing you. So in the second one, I said um, maximum of 25 brewer's grains. It wanted to use more of it. And it's telling me that if you took that off, I'd save $4.89 per ton. Um, and arbitrarily, I applied $50 a ton for all the food waste products. And that's versus uh, 310 for wheat. And I told it, you know, it wanted to use wheat. I said, you can use wheat. We may want to use it as a pellet binder, but limit that to 12%. So let's look at the nutrient side. And then uh, I think as somebody else mentioned earlier, you know, we put in the vitamins and trace minerals. I allow it to take some phosphate or limestone. It used a little bit of the, the, the meat. And then what we did on the nutrient side, uh, the top row is energy. I said you need to have uh, at least 3,100, but don't use any more than uh, 3,200. And because a lot of those food wastes are high in fat, even though I haven't analyzed the fat, and I guesstimated that from the internet, so that not, may not be that accurate, it said, oh, I want to use more energy. But I limited that, and that cost me money. Um, protein, you got to use at least 18%, no problem, 18.57. These are all the amino acids here, uh, digestible, arginine, lysine, methionine, cysteine, M plus C, tryptophan, isoleucine, threonine, valine, no problem at all. It met all those with flying colors and there's plenty of extra for almost every single one of them. So even if, even if the protein's a bit heat damaged. Based on this, there's going to be heaps of amino acids that we don't really have to worry too much about. Calcium and phosphorus. Uh, I said you got to use at least 0.8, but don't use any more than 0.82 calcium. Well, it's used 0.82, the high end, and uh, that cost that cost me money. It cost me two dollars. So this morning. Nishal came in and said, you know, let's see that formula. So he said, I'll oh, take off that calcium, give it, let it take a 1%. So we did that, and what it did is it, it just took limestone in. So you really have to play around with the thing and, you know, restrict things and allow things to come in, and it'll, it'll uh, give you a real feeling for what the value of, of the products are. Um, yeah, so that's about it. Anybody have any questions on that? So that's just meeting the nutrient requirements. The next thing is, uh, you know, is the variation over time and everything else. My, hang on, my idea behind that would be to get uh, something called an NIR instrument, which uh, can take the place of a laboratory measurement, but you have to train the in, in, instrument with laboratory measurements. And then once the instrument is calibrated, you put a sample in of any one of those and it'll, within a minute, it'll tell you what the nutrient content is. So that'd be really useful for that system. Have I gone over time, Norm? No, no not very good. Um, yeah, I think um, the maths is very interesting, isn't it? Um, uh, just like it, uh, when VJ did it originally, we were damn close. And we just did it at random. We didn't really do anything. We just said, oh, well, let's just mix this stuff and see how we go. But um, obviously tweaking it and continuing to tweak it and getting ourselves in a position where, um, as, as uh, Robert said, we can test things really quickly and make decisions on what we're going to put in very quickly to meet the requirements. But as you can see, I don't know, what would you say we're... 90% of the of the product there, aren't we? Yeah, and you know, you, you can tell you, you, we'll be able to get the relative value so you can say, well, you know, we make all those streams and you know, we blend this and that and then that one's left over in a large supply. Maybe you just don't get that one. Mm -hmm.